The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Good morning. Welcome to SELF 2012. Uh, this is Mr. James Schweitzer. He works with Open Source at IBM, and he's going to be talking to us about learning by tinkering. Hey, I'm unmuted, so I'm ready to go. Um, okay, he already introduced me as James Schweitzer, so that makes it easy. I do have to go off here and say that um, I do work at IBM, but pretty much anything I put in my presentation would probably be disavowed pretty quickly by the bureaucracy, even though most of my peers probably like it. So this is not official IBM. So, okay. Um, that keeps my job secure for another week or so, and um, we'll go on to this one. Um, tinkering in education. I found um, in a lot of cases it's very entertaining for children to actually do things as opposed to learn them or see them in a book. Um, when you when you actually do an experiment that changes the color of something or build something that they can use later on, it seems to stick in the head a lot better. Not for everybody, because you know, differentiated education, lots of different things when you're playing with this. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm going to turn it into an actual presentation. And I'm going to start with my first one here, the bow and arrow. Now, in most cases, it's actually not that difficult. Well, it is incredibly difficult because I'm like on my 10th iteration of the bow and arrow uh, trying to make one. This one here I actually got at woodbows.com because they're professionals um, and do it. Mine are actually uh, pretty sad. I got to the point where I can put like a stick through the back, um, do drywall, as I've learned in my garage. I'm playing with that one. But it's, uh, the, I think the key is here is why it's just something that's fairly entertaining, because right now in popular culture, you can see um, I was walking through a, um, I was walking through the sporting goods sections of a local store in Charlotte, and I'm seeing teenage girls standing around looking at bows and arrows. Um, pretty exciting, and I, I blame it all on the Hunger Games for right now. But I think we got this one. That's going to be the new green arrow, by the way. So um, if we're looking out there, but it's something fun to play with. Um, just so we can pass around, give you guys something to play, to look at. On this one, I didn't bring the arrows because I was um, at a previous conference. They followed me through the uh, presentation and uh, looked a little bit nervous when I did that one over at PauseCon. But, um, okay, I'm back feeding here. Uh, okay, don't stand on the wire. That was the, that's another key lesson here today. Um, but I've learned, um, as you go into this, it's like there's a lot of interesting things that you can dig out on it. Um, when you shoot an arrow, the physics of how it flies, um, the woodwork of actually creating the arrow, um, the history that comes around it, that's an English longbow, obviously. You can go back to the Battle of Arrancott and tie things in. So it has, a, it has the fun of actually putting in a, um, of tying in a lot of history with it, too. Okay. This one here is actually because I've uh, I actually brought out my, my daughter started calling uh, Monopoly Monopoly. So it's like it started off as um, having to correct her on the pronunciation. But um, actually, a, it, I think we started going into the conversation of a game and why everything was named after um, a street in Atlantic City. And you started going with some of the other things. Why the railroads, they are all ones that serve Atlantic City, the B&O, Pennsylvania, and that kind of things. So actually, it's like using a game as another way of like as a teaching tool, even something as simple as Monopoly. Um, and one interesting thing is when you play, um, it always turns out that a high percentage of the people who win are the first one who gets a set of like one of the uh, of one of the boards. Also, you got percentages too. We get up there with like Tennessee Avenue and that kind of stuff up here in the orange section. Um, okay, light. I got to learn how to do that again, but. Um, Actually, that's the ones people land on the most. Um, but if you end up getting any three set, and you have like one or two of the other ones, on that one, keep anybody else from getting a set. It's almost like the uh, way patents work. 
in a sense. You're basically, um, you basically deny anybody else and then eventually you start taking over everything from just owning one set. So it's actually one of those interesting ones too. Um, I'm ex-military, so, and Navy actually, so that's why Risk is actually, it's an entertaining game, so I you know, played it ever since I was a kid. But uh, as I went in there, there's some other really interesting things if you look at the board and the dynamics and how it moves uh, when you look at world uh, politics. If you take Brazil, North Africa, South Europe, and um, the Middle East, you actually dominate four content continents, keep anybody else from able to get them, and um, you have to, it's, so it's an interesting block. Um, but then I get to go, then I always drop into the naval conversation, how the British dominated the world on this one from one little dot and really didn't have, and what they did is hit all the choke points, hit Gibraltar, hit the Straits of Malacca, hit South Africa before they built the Suez Canal, then took the Suez Canal when they, when they actually built that. And of course, this extension of, um, historical extension of as a naval power to the United States, grabbing Panama and other, like, um, and other choke points. And actually, to be able to, so risk is actually a very poor analogy for how the world actually works but it's a good starting point for conversations. And I'm sure you can do that with a bunch of other games too. It's really just breaking down and discovering what's, um, what's hitting in some of these things and some of the hidden messages. Um, especially to go to jail and Monopoly, that happens a lot too. So, so unfortunately it doesn't happen in the real world so you get to get into some of that political stuff. Okay, oh, Charlotte, if you guys haven't noticed, is gonna get the uh, Democratic National Convention in here. And of course, the first thing I thought of is when they were talking about the NATO summit in uh, Chicago and the people getting arrested for making Molotov cocktails was making napalm. So, okay, good reference book, Illustrated Guide to Home Chemistry from Make. Um, we can pack that through. Just as a future reference, I do not suggest if you're like gonna occupy or tea party uh, the DNC or anything like that, making napalm and taking it, but. But that is the first thing that really popped to mind. So, um, and actually, that's much better than the Molotov cocktail. And I just think about that. Um, and some of the rules that come around with chemistry on this one. Um, I was working in Texas, and I found out I couldn't order Erlacher tubes or containers, the little triangle things, because people were using them in meth labs. So they outlawed them or outlawed the ability to order them. Um, so you have to actually have special permission and that kind of thing. Or if you go through some other options on this one. When I made gunpowder, um, well, that, that just happened to be the week the TSA decided to like, use their little scrubbing things on my bag. So that was, another, that was another interesting, why you always get to the airport two hours ahead of time. Um, and take the sharp edge off your soldering iron if you go through the TSA too, but that's another story. But, um, but this is an interesting thing, but again, it's the legal consequences sometimes that deal into this, and you, got, you get to bring in, it's like if you're tinkering and playing with chemistry sets at home, um, probably a good idea to, um, well, I won't say that. I don't want to inform the police on this side and this side, but a lot of the things you're doing are something that could be construed as uh, questionable by other people. By the way, if you do make the napalm, um, don't set it off on asphalt. It does, asphalt is flammable. So. Um, I have a nice mark on my street in front of my house now. Um, keep a uh, fire extinguisher nearby. But it's actually incredibly easy too. You, all you really need is gasoline and a styrofoam. And you just like keep adding styrofoam until it's, all the gasoline is soaked up. But another story. Oh, this I got yesterday. So this is showing what I did last night as opposed to like practicing my presentation. So. Um, by the way, I grew up and was educated entirely in the state of South Carolina, so if you have any questions about my, um, the, since uh, I'm not a native English speaker, um, feel, free, feel free to throw a question out any time you guys want to. Um, so this is what I did last night. Um, and actually, Tux was there, that was just serendipity. Um, he's, I've had that thing like for decades, and it just happened to be sitting by my TV. Um, that, that's about as far as I got was the command prompt. So that's what you, that's what you get with like um, a red eye and um, four hours worth of playing around in the, that before a presentation. But if anybody wants to see one live, feel free to open the box and take a peek. Um, now, 
it's like you were asking me before about here on the Arduino boards, and actually I do like to play a lot with those. Um, there's a few interesting things out there. Um, most of it's brand new, uh, and lots of things you can play with, but um, this seems to be the hot thing of the week, so I kind of went ahead and threw that out and had it come in place. Uh, another interesting site here, um, I introduced my uh, older daughter to, um, Tinkercad. I don't know if anybody's actually tried that before, but you actually make your 3D objects so um, for using with a 3D printer. Um, I probably would have showed you guys a 3D printer, but right now it's in parts in, in my yard, or in my, uh, still in construction. Um, so it's again, just something neat to play with. You get to do the three-dimensional thing. You get to learn from something like this, making, thing, making objects in three dimensions and playing with them. And, um, and it's very easy. And by the way, my daughter is, um, my older daughter is 10, my younger one's eight. They both can use it without much trouble. And uh, they make interesting things. And um, we haven't got to the point where you can actually print them out, but we're getting close. So as soon as I, as soon as I figure out how to make the printer work. Um, here's one that's interesting. And actually, you can see I modified it because I'm better with woodwork than I, because my 3D printer doesn't work yet, so I can't do the, uh, the little plastic thing and print it out. But this is actually a three-dimensional scanner. Um, and we can, if we uh, get through the presentation, I went ahead and brought the box, and we can actually uh, plug that in and show it. Um, got a laser. Probably won't show up anywhere. I think everything's too far away on that one with the line laser. But basically, it's using a old PS3 uh, camera and a line laser. And if you go to uh, Maker Scanner, and it'll link you into how to actually do this. Um, this was a nice afternoon worth of work after I got all the parts in place, uh, or got a, found all the parts laying around, and um, painter's tape from where I was working. So I was actually able to take this on an airplane. So one other thing, and I only got a, uh, a short delay while the uh, TSA in Los Angeles uh, entertained me um, or asked questions about it. Um, another thing on this one is um, robot operating system. Uh, it's uh, something else that's very entertaining and playing with. Um, I didn't drag the NXT around because um, as I flew in last night, I couldn't find it. My daughter let it loose someplace in the house, and yeah, probably the batteries ended up dying. But I know it's there someplace. But a robot operating system actually has a nice driver for the NXT. Um, but it also works on multiple more mature um, robots, too. Um, one's based on Arduinos, or um, hopefully one based on a Raspberry Pi in the near future. Um, We'll see how it goes. But it's a good starting point, and it is open source, so always a good thing to start with. Um, feel free to ask questions or like throw out ideas here, because yeah, actually, that's the point I was at. Um, well, anybody got any questions? Anything they uh, want to talk about, throw out there? Go ahead. Yes. Oh, on that one, I had the Debian one, because it was the quickest one to download, frankly, and I figured that would work. So, um, on the first shot. Um, I'm, I'm pro, no? He asked me which one I started on the Pi. Um, they have four distros on there. I think there's an Arch Linux on that one, and um, I'm really more of a Fedora fan for what I do. So, um, but, catch up. hmm? They catch up. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's drivers just turning, turning, turning. Yeah. Yeah, again, it's just one of those things where, um, well, I, I actually I like Fedora because it plan translates right into work. What I do for a living is generally you touch Red Hat or SUSE, and less SUSE now. Um, but um, when you're doing that one, it's actually a nice translation. Actually, I have a hard time remembering the different commands and translating it. And um, even when you go back to, like, what, uh, what are those things, traditional Unixes? like AIX, and um, you don't see HPUX much anymore, and Solaris is starting to disappear, but, yeah, so. I blame people, that's yeah. horrible, but. Mm -hmm. Oh, different things. All right, um, any other questions or things on there? Because um, I know I forgot like a million things on this one, and I think that like the things I've built on that thing, I could throw things out on that one. 
Um, we did do the six inch telescope on a reflector, which I forgot to take a picture of and didn't bring this time. It brought the POSCON. And um, that's probably another reason why they were following me around. I had a wagon with like a you know, telescope that was five foot long and I was carrying bows and arrows and that kind of stuff. So, um, so I, I toned it down for this one because I have to live here mainly because I, I still live in the county. So if they call the police, I don't want to get on any kind of list. But um, other projects or other things or? Um, there's a few things. Um, uh, he's asking if I, what I've done with Arduino or played around with other ARM-based things. Um, I have tried a small ro working robot from Freescale, but frankly, the, um, almost all their drivers were built around Windows. So I got to the point where I could get everything to move on Windows, and then I tried to move it over to Linux, and the drivers have to be rewritten, and I struggled with that. So. Um, but again, I don't blame it. I think, I think Freescale is a good product. It's just a matter of like, my lack of skill with programming on that side and um, my insistence on not having a Windows machine in my house. So, so that's part of, all, about the, part of the problem there. Um, as we go the other way with Arduinos, um, there are lots of things you can do. And it's remarkable where you can get like, information from. Um, Poplar Mechanics, um, within the last three, four months, actually had a build your first robot Arduino-based one. That's a very nice one and very simple kit to start with. Um, Parallax just came out with a modification to their Board of Education. They've been doing basic stamp forever. And I remember building like one of their robot arms like uh, a decade, 15 years ago. Um, we're using their basic stamp. Now they have a Board of Education which plugs on top of the Arduino and you can act in all their, their entire range of sensors. Um, SparkFun is another great place for getting uh, learn at SparkFun.com. They have like 50 different things you can do on this side that, um, that are very well set up. And another thing that can play around. So uh, lots of places you can get references on this one. Um, one thing I'm doing for Arduino, um, I'm actually thinking of changing jobs and changing locations, so I haven't quite got all the way on this one yet. Um, changing jobs within IBM, by the way, so if like, if they, any of my HR people are watching. So, um, is actually building a, um, a greenhouse with water sensors. Um, there's actually a nice one on that one, and I'm trying to think of um, a, a DF Robotics actually has, sells the water sensors. So, there's again, tons of stuff out there and things you can fly with and start with on that one. Um, and actually, when we think about the Raspberry Pi is actually a good example. One thing I was thinking about on that um, is I remember growing up as a kid, and this is like 30 years ago. I'm 15 years old. I got my first computer, an Atari 800, um, which I spent hours typing in programs on out of magazines. Um, and I realized that I, just, I was thinking today it had 48K of memory. Uh, I remember how excited I was when I got a, a uh, disk drive that, had, that could store a 140K program on it and then using the hole puncher so I could flip it over and store another 140K on the other side. Um, and realizing this Raspberry Pi, I, I plugged in an 8 gig SD card with the program and used Gparted, of course, to expand it um, so I could use the entire amount off the image they created. Um, it's built-in memory. It's 10 times more powerful. And if I remember right, um, that Atari 800 cost me about 380 bucks at the time, so this $35 Raspberry Pi is 10% of the cost and hundreds of times more powerful. I could, you say, you can run web servers on it fairly easily, but that's like the first thing that popped into mind is an embedded web server. Um, but it's more and powerful enough to run some of the things, some of the basic programming languages like uh, MIT Scratch on that one. I think it can wing that. I, I know a relatively, uh, use laptop can, so that's like, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do with that thing. Um, I did it Thursday, my oh, kids were using it. Cool. Five, so, yeah. Okay, so you got it then, so you've seen the territory. Yep. You got yours quicker. That's the, or mine. Wednesday. Okay, so yeah, you're right, it's thing. they're finally starting to ship on those things. So. It's, um, which one did you get it from? The Debian includes Scratch right on it. Oh, it does, so cool. I haven't gotten that far yet, because yeah, it's like I was getting on. really tired last night, but yeah. yeah, but you got it on that side. Um, it's all timing. No, that's perfect. 
Um, and just for repeating on the question, he was saying that Scratch was already built onto uh, the Debian distro for the Raspberry Pi. Okay, I'm babbling, but um, anybody else got questions or something else you want to throw out? Are you a member of a, a hackerspace or makers group or something um, in your area? If well, I wish I was, actually. There is one in Charlotte that's um, fairly aggressive and it's uh, tied in well to Charlotte Lug. Um, but unfortunately, with my travel, it makes it extremely difficult. Um, I'm actually not in Charlotte most of the time. So um, everything I do is like pretty much I live out of that bag. Uh, whatever I can fit in the bag and take with me or bring home. But the important thing is it's like you know, when my children get involved with it afterwards. Um, it's a lot of things that we've done with that, it's, um, and having a hacker space, it's like really it's weekend time. So yes, I probably should be involved, but yeah. But um, it's always a timing thing. But right now, I have enough tools to keep us busy. Maybe when I get older and we need things that are a little bit more destructive, we'll consider that. So, um, okay. Anything else out there? But uh, no, it's a great opportunity. It's like um, to do that. If you look at my garage right now, I just realize it's like, my wife piles stuff on top of all my stuff, so I have to clean before I can actually do anything on the weekends, but that's another story. Conflict. Um, another one of those things the difference between four, 15 and 45, but um, any other questions? Yes? With you having kids that are almost the same age as mine, mm -hmm. I, I find it hard to find sites for them. Yes. They don't know C, they don't know Java, but mm -hmm. are there any sites that you could recommend that are good for them? Hacker sites based, I mean, makes good DIY.org just came out. Yeah. It's kind of cool, but is there yeah. anything? Yeah. Well, I like to learn at sparkfun.com. has an, That's a brand new site, and um, that actually has a ton of light, simple projects that are very easy um, to do at that age group and slightly older. Um, we actually spend a lot of time in the age group um, with Legos at this point. So, and um, she's, uh, she's actually starting to robot, the older one's starting to robot class um, at the Lego store up in North Charlotte next week. So, um, she's already, hopefully, had a head start and she'll do well with that. But, um, so, there, there's a lot of interesting things out there, but it's, um, yeah, the younger age groups are a little more difficult right now. We spend a lot of time actually um, teaching them not to put your fingers under the rotating on the saw and that kind of stuff. So, um, or, but I mean, I, I let my daughters like set off the uh, gunpowder because, frankly, I make it so poorly that it doesn't explode; it just sparkles. So, um, I didn't let them touch the napalm. So there, there are balances on this one. You know, teaching them some of the basics like um, wearing eye protection, wearing gloves. Um, keeping a fire extinguisher nearby, I know, little things like that is where I'm targeting on this one. As the electronics and the programming go, um, my younger daughter is actually making uh, stop motion movies with her Legos now, so, um, so we're slowly getting there. So it's, um, but it all depends, I guess, on um, how mature the kid is and how much you trust them. So, or actually they're kids, they're gonna hurt themselves eventually anyway. Okay, I washed out the screen. Any other questions? Anything else going? Because I'm sure I'm well ahead on time. He hasn't shown up. He hasn't put up my five-minute warning thing sign yet. So. You got 30 minutes. Holy crap! Yeah, I always speak too fast. That's um, one of those sessions. That's why they don't give me the good speaking spots. Yeah. Oh yeah. We can demonstrate the scanner. Let's see if we can make a wing here at this. Thank you. See, this is what a red eye and not sleeping, like, um, not sleeping on a regular basis does to you. I actually have a 10-year-old daughter, too, that I get mm -hmm. involved. Yeah. And, uh, there's a good book series that uh, I forgot what the publisher's name is, or the author's name is, mm -hmm. on Amazon. But those NXT Legos, they actually have book series, like just, uh, like the one I've been doing with my daughter is called, like, um, Breaking into the Mind Pyramids. And they actually, they don't actually, it's not an instruction mm -hmm. book, like, put these Legos together here and here, put this block on here basically tell you, I have a problem to solve, you got to get this robot into a small passageway and trip a trigger plate, that type of thing. And then they kind of give you hints on design. And that's why it's using that as a daughter, it's a very compelling thing that you felt like you know, an NXT robot that chases down the line, you know, stuff like that. It isn't like a cookbook kind of build if you actually have to think. Yeah. My daughter's been truly engaged in that for the last year or so. Right. What did you search for? Um, for 
you look at the NXT robot, look for Mayan on Amazon, you'll probably find okay. it. Okay, um, as I'm repeating that question, NXT robot Mayan is a good learning resource, uh, something, um, if you find it out, give me the name so we can uh, repeat that for the presentation or the television person. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, no, it's it's very similar to Scratch actually, the way they put it together with the little the little uh, blocks that you yeah. click together. Let's see here. The Mayan Adventure. Yeah, that sounds good. James Floyd Kelly. Okay. The Mayan Adventure by James Floyd Kelly. I want to look that one up. It's really cool. They got about thirteen different challenges in the book. They kind of you know, they, there's a lot of imagination involved, so kind of. Oh yeah, and you see, this is how I mess up here. It's like how many times I have to do to upgrade my box because I don't know all the commands and I'm mixing them up with yum commands and that kind of stuff. But here we go. Let's see if this actually kicks off. Oh, there we go. And see, so got the camera. And if I turn on the laser, oh, not oh, sorry. See, that's another thing. Learn to turn around. Come on, computer. There we go. All right. And of course, I actually didn't, I didn't do any of this stuff, obviously. But um, you see the top green line tells you the top of the scan, middle green line. And then we throw on the laser. And the idea is to get that to the point where it's kind of in the middle. And let's see here. I want you a little. Yes. I actually forget how to do this because it's been a week or two, and uh, yes, I know, that's scary on that side. Um, let's see, get the laser on there. Oh, I'm supposed to cover it there. Let's see here. Okay, normally on this one here is you need a nice bat white background to make it work, but we're going to cheat a little bit. Um, anybody got an object? Yeah, that's a box. It's a square. We'll use it. Here we go. Oops, I got to put this actual program back up there. Let's see here. Okay, start scan. There we go. Ooh, restart. That's what I get for doing an upgrade and not looking. There we go. There we go. Nice uh, box there. Let's see here, turn this off, click on start scan, and yeah, we'll call it point cloud again. Yeah, I did my shoe earlier, but you can see how long ago, it's like, wow, that's a, that is a long time ago. Yeah, I'll replace it. Cover the laser, done. Center the laser, boom, centered. How that? that looked like about 25, 50 centimeters to you? That's probably a little more. Mm, okay. I don't think I have to be perfect on this one. Yeah, I do. But it'll be okay. Oops. Let's replace it. Let's let that go there. All right, cover the laser. Done. Center of the laser. Oh, that's right. Mm, yeah, I got a little angle here. This is what happens when you make it with like painter's tape and other fun things like that. It means you can make field mods like you did. Yes. <laughs> yes. Funny to have you cover it and then center it. It's covered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, now I gotta actually do it. This is actually the fun part. You have to move this thing back and forth really slow. Oops, not going there. Might be too flat. 
Hmm? Yeah, it's there. I can see the little blue dots, but I think I got too, uh, too boring a uh, coverage here. Okay, let's try it again with an angle. See if we can get something like that. All right, cover laser. I cheat with my cover laser, I actually turn it off. And then we center the laser. Yeah, it's still centered. And I can see the little blue dots on there. I don't know if you guys can see it on the screen. But normally this thing gets covered up with a nice like blue presentation doohickey as we go back and forth with the laser. Yeah, that's the real problem is I don't have the right background. I'm like picking up too much other stuff. I actually take in the scanner just can't reach some of the other things that are out there. Yeah. No, that's it. Black and white. Oh, white normally works good. Here we go. Yeah, if I'm just too, uh, now I'm too far away. When I did this, I did it on a wall. So um, if you actually go with the actual software here. I had a nice white wall behind me, but that's, uh, again, another one of those interesting things. Replace. All right, covered laser. Done. You can throw out other questions as, uh, as you want to on this one. Um, have you ever tried the uh, test? Uh, I have one, and I have the book. This, um, and I actually have an old R, uh, like a four-wheeler my girls have outgrown that um, I was going to glue it onto. I had it working with like a webcam before. And um, oh, yes, if I ever tried to connect, by the way. Um, I had it working with a webcam driving around the backyard um, using actually this laptop at one point but um, as its controller, but it kept running into the fence because it didn't turn soon enough. But hopefully with the connect, I'll be able to upgrade that. But that's going to be another project. Um, well, let's get into frames. I'm going to turn the laser on. All right. I'm sorry. Oh, that's working a little better. Yes, there it is. It's, um, it, it's actually, and of course, Microsoft has actually embraced it. Yeah, I'm not getting a good luck on this one. I'm getting a few points. Um, as, you, as you look on there on the screen, you can see a few small blue dots. So they might not have the resolution up there. But normally what ends up happening on this picture is you get a cut, you just swing it back and forth on that, and it turns blue. But can, you, can you go through a, just a few of the design criteria it does. Um, actually, you have a you have a set on how far away it is. Normally, uh, the default's 50 centimeters. When I did it before, um, no, the camera, do the camera and oh. the laser have to be separated like that? Or? Um, they, they do for the angle. Uh -huh. So, um, at least according to the wiki. Actually, I haven't. Um, the physics have thrown me off a little bit on that. But in general, yes. It does, it does need to be separated by a, a small distance, and actually, this is pretty close to what the, uh, the printout is. Um, just doesn't have the fancy things on there, like um, a little turning knob and everything else. Um, so the offset of the angle actually makes it possible to, um, to get the three dimensions to the laser. The laser is what you're actually focusing on and painting the object with. Um, there's actually another one that came out. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's yes. Hmm? Where did you get the oh, it's a line laser. It's like three bucks on Amazon. Okay. Uh, or you can get it from buy.com, a bunch of other places. They asked me where I got the uh, laser from. So, um, yeah, it's just called a line laser, line laser um, red, three ohms. Um, the camera is far more expensive, but um, frankly, you can pick them up for like 20 bucks on, uh, as refurbs. Um, connects are also very good at that, too. I mean, you asked earlier, you can. Um, I picked up a Kinect for just a little over $60 uh, as a refurb device. Um, and you just look around on the website till you find them, especially these things you're going to like, throw around and take apart and play with. Um, actually, that's what I was looking forward to. I actually I got my, um, uh, 
oh, Kindle, that's what they call them. Um, I got a Kindle in, but the truth is, uh, when, you, when you look at the Kindle, when you start taking it apart by parts, that little screen is like 80 bucks, and you can get like a refurbished Kindle where I had a special deal and it got them for like 50. And then there's like a whole, you got the inside computer in there, which I think would be a little harder to work with, but a battery and a power supply that's already hooked up for that too. So scavenging parts is actually one of the funner things that yeah, you can do with I've, this. I've scavenged about 150 stepper motors from yep. old copiers. Yep. Copiers that are really, really good. Yep. And laser printers too, we're in the same idea. There's some on that one. And, uh, and, and when you start dealing with them, he was talking about um, uh, getting old stepper motors out of copiers. And, um, and the thing is, yeah, when you really break it down, it's almost all these like electronic devices. A stepper motor, has, you have two wires, sometimes three. No, not a stepper motor. No, I'm getting mixed up on that one, yeah. But you, brush motor, yeah. Brush motor, sorry. I'm going on that one. I, see, that's the thing. I don't actually know the terminology. I'm just winging it. But making a robot yeah. out of a stepper motor. I mean, you have stepper mm -hmm. motors. Mm -hmm. Old scooters are really good. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's always something to take apart. That, that's one of the keys on that one. It's um, taking apart is almost as fun as putting together. So, okay. Um, well, I'm failing on this one. Uh, generally, I had a, the only time I've done this before is a big white wall behind it. So, for the camera, is there anything specific, or just any webcam will do? I haven't tried it with any webcam other than the Sony's. The Sony's seem to have a very good, um, yeah, i say they focus very well. They, um, they seem to have a better range of range than other webcams. Um, I was going to try it with another one, but again, that's one of those timing things. And, um, and I got like three of those laying around now as people, like, people dump these things all the time. So. Um, for some reason, it doesn't seem to be nearly as popular as it used to be, so, or ever was. Was it ever popular? I don't know, the PS3 with the Kinect with the little glowing ball? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, that's one of those things. Um, any other questions, something else we can throw out? Give you guys some time back. All right, well, I appreciate it. If, um, again, if anybody wants to come up and play, I'm more than happy to hang out for a while, but, um, Thanks for your time. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. 
At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros convoy communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. <laughs>